Hello, everyone. We're going to give this just a second for the room to populate so everyone can get in today. Hopefully, those of you who live in the generic southeast, I guess, are surviving Hurricane Helene okay. That was a massive storm, so I hope everyone's doing okay right now. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so we can get this program started. Uh, let me start by saying you're here today for our September free webinar, Consideration and Care of Islamic Collections. Um, we're gonna be running from about one to 2 p.m. Eastern. So it'll be about an hour's worth of programming. Um, so we're really excited to have everyone join us today. My name is Robin Bauer Kilgo. I am the C2C Care Coordinator. If you have any questions about today's program, please feel free to reach out to me at that email address, c2cc at culturalheritage.org. And this is our home on the web, connecting to collections.org. On that website, you will see all sorts of fun uh, past information for C2C Care. We have our list of upcoming webinars on there, which I'm gonna talk about here in a second, a link to um, our courses, our course archive, our webinar archive, a link to our community, which is a great place if you have questions for direct care. Um, we have a fabulous group of volunteers who monitor the questions and find, then reach out to another fabulous group of experts to answer the questions. So if you have any kind of um, really good questions about direct care when it comes to collections to institutions, we encourage you to go out and check out that community. And lastly, we have a link to curated resources on that website as well. So all that can be found there. We have two homes on social media where you can find out information about upcoming programming for C2C Care. One is on Facebook. The other one is on the network formerly known as X, um, or formerly known as Twitter, excuse me. The handle for both of those is at C2C Care. So I encourage you to follow both of those if you're on those social networks. And a couple of quick tech notes uh, before we go into some of the programming information coming up. Um, you have two ways to communicate with us today in the webinar. You have the chat box, which is pretty much what I like to call stream of consciousness. Um, pretty much if you want to say hello, say where you're located, you're welcome to use that chat box. Um, that's always fun to kind of see where people are at. If you have a question for a speaker at any point during the program, we encourage you to use the Q&A box. That Q&A box is a really nice way for us to track the questions, make sure we're hitting them all. Um, sometimes with the chat box, it can kind of be lost in the stream of consciousness that is that box. So again, please, if you have a question at any point, put it in the Q&A box. We have quite a few webinars coming up. Um, we've actually programmed out through January of 2025. So if you're interested in any of our free webinar programming, please go to our website. The first one's actually scheduled for October 17th. It's the State of Mental Health for Workers at Cultural Heritage Institutions. You might all notice a QR code that's sitting next to that one. Um, the group who's heading up that webinar is actually asking for input from the audience. They want to find out about the state of kind of how you're feeling about working within cultural heritage. So through October 4th, you can actually link to that or take a picture of that QR code. It'll throw you out to a Google form um, and you can answer some questions that they'll then incorporate in the presentation. So I encourage you to do that. November 14th, we have Keeping the Groove, Caring for Grooved Audio Media. Someone coming from the Smithsonian Folk Life Program is going to come talk to us about that, um, to kind of how to care for records, even their enclosing albums, all that kind of fun stuff. So I, that would, should be a good time. A week later, we'll be doing a webinar for contamination and pesticide residues for small and mid-sized cultural institutions. Nice long title. Um, basically what that webinar is going to be about is about a lot of us dealing with small and mid-sizing, mid-sized institutions are finding a lot of heavy leads and pesticides within our collection, um, especially dealing with the most recent NAGPRA laws. A lot of those collections are either going back to the tribal communities they started from, or you're talking to them about what they are dealing with. In that webinar, we're hoping to cover kind of how institutions can identify uh, pesticides, how the tribal communities are dealing with them, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and that webinar is actually a precursor to a course that we're planning to have in early 2025. So if you want to find out more information on that, I encourage you to go to that webinar. And finally, in January, we have our first webinar for 2025, which we're kind of going back old school. We're going to be talking about care of newspaper clippings. I know a lot of us have to deal with those within our institutions. 
Um, we do have a speaker from NARA who's going to come talk to us about that. So we're pretty excited about that one to start off 2025. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and I'm going to introduce you guys to our speaker today. Her name is Aisha Wahab. She's a paper conservator at the Stanford University Libraries. Today, she's going to be talking to us just about Islamic and or Islamic collections, kind of how we care for them, um, what kind of considerations we should do as collecting institutions and kind of further information on that. So Aisha, take over whenever you're ready and I'll be here for the Q&A section at the end of the program. Thank you, Robin. Um, I'll start sharing my screen. Does that show up on your end? Looks beautiful. Okay, great. Uh, thank you to Connecting to Collection Care for the invitation to speak here today on this topic that's both professionally and personally important to me. I would like to formally welcome everyone with Assalamu Alaikum, which means peace be upon you, a common Arabic greeting that's used in the Middle East and throughout the world by Muslims. Considerations and care of Islamic collections is an overwhelmingly large subject for a one hour webinar, but hopefully even with the expansive subject matter in today's short time, it's my hope you'll be able to walk away with more knowledge than when you came into the webinar. And we'll be going over what is Islamic hit material culture. Are there differences between material objects, including sacred objects, and religious and culturally respectful approaches for care practices? The presentation is not meant to be comprehensive, but meant to provide basic information and to start a conversation. When discussing cultural heritage, it's important to look beyond the static object and to recognize the people, peoples, and or cultures that are tied to the object and whose identity and being may be deeply connected to its creation and existence. When this culture and identity through livelihood or material objects are threatened, we as cultural heritage professionals must also acknowledge, speak out, and stand up. It would be inappropriate to discuss the care of Islamic collections in our institutions when this cultural heritage is under threat in many areas of the world and millions of people whose culture these collection materials belong to are dying, suffering, being targeted or persecuted. It would be remiss to not acknowledge the current deep suffering and loss of peoples who hold the, a connection to Islamic collections. To recognize some, if we can't mention all the significant current events taking place during this presentation recorded in 2024, including Israel's colonization, occupation and genocide in Palestine, and the destruction of cultural heritage sites that have been systematically targeted by the state of Israel. The significant loss of lives, famine, and current suffering, and the damage of material culture and looting in Sudan with the ongoing civil war. The systematic erasure of Uyghur identity and culture by the Chinese government. The targeting of Muslims and Mughal cultural heritage sites in India by the rising Hindu nationalist movement. And the persecution of the Rohingya by the state of Myanmar. Islamic collections encompass material heritage, but people's livelihood, freedom, and well-being should never be dis disconnected from its existence and protection of their cultural heritage. For what is cultural heritage without its people? In presenting on this topic of the care of Islamic collections, it would also be remiss for me to not recognize the bias and hypocrisy in our profession when it comes to the care of this cultural heritage and its people around the world. Particularly in the past year of this presentation in 2023 and 2024 with the silence and censorship about Palestinian cultural heritage preservation from our cultural heritage institutions like AIC, ICOM, and many major museums and libraries in North America and Europe that has been racist and hypocritical. As a professional who has had posts concerning Palestinian cultural heritage censored by the same organization this presentation is linked to, my decision presenting here today was a difficult one. I chose to give this presentation because Islamic cultural heritage is deeply personal to me, and I believe that this presentation may provide helpful information to my colleagues in small to medium-sized institutions to better understand and care for the materials under their protection. I truly hope that it does so. So let's begin by first talking about Islamicate collections. What are Islamicate collections? Why use the term Islamicate? 
and what complexities do we need to take into consideration? One of the aspects that make discussing Islamic collections, including caring for these materials so complex to talk about is the wide variety of materials, geographic region and time period that make up this material cultural history. Many argue it's a global cultural history. The religion of Islam began in 610 CE in the Arabian Peninsula with the revelation of the Quran, the holy book for Muslims to the prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. The Islamic world quickly expanded outside the Arab world, developing vast trade networks and forming societies and multiple empires on different continents, altering, shaping, and creating rich Islamic culture, including Islamic material culture. Islamic collections, however, in Europe and North America coincided with the academic art history field that developed in the 19th century, which focused on an Orientalist Arab-centric view of the Islamic world. Islamic art history, manuscript studies, and adjacent disciplinary fields have evolved beyond such a narrow and monolithic lens, but are only beginning to challenge lingering Orientalist notions and bias limitations of the Islamic world. Let's look at the Metropolitan Museum of Art's Islamic world map from 1975. It includes the Middle East, a few parts of North Africa, Spain, some of Central Asia, and a few parts of the subcontinent. In 2018, the newly renovated British Museum's Al Bukhari Foundation Gallery of the Islamic World opened, and you can see the map on the map just how much greater the Islamic world geographic region is being defined and represented in the collection. The collection now includes material culture by people from West and East Africa all the way across to Southeast Asia and China. The practice of Islam and by Muslims has continued to the present day with the current estimate of 1.9 billion Muslims living around the globe, about 25% of the world population, making up diverse range of cultures, ethnicities, languages, politics, and religious practice. In Islamic art and collections have not ceased to exist and contemporary Islamic visual culture, including art is being created every day. So what are the boundaries of contemporary Islamic material culture? Does it include the Muslim diaspora from predominant Muslim regions, non-diasporic Muslims, black American Muslims and other American Muslims, non-Muslims whose art is heavily influenced by traditional Islamic aesthetic culture and history? These are questions that are currently being debated. Institutions may choose to acquire and exhibit these artworks in contemporary American or Islamic galleries, or books may be acquired by libraries and added to their Middle East and North African section, their art and architecture section, or their Islamic section, for example. So how do we talk about the considerations and care of Islamic collection items? The point is there's no single concise answer culturally, socially, or religiously, and it continues to become even more complex when we talk about considerations and care as we recognize a greater landscape of Islamic culture. With its many landscapes, the Islamic world is not monolithic and one can argue doesn't have finite boundaries. Collections from the Islamic world encompass not only various ethnicities, cultures, social and political landscapes, but religions as well. People of many faiths are present in the Islamic world. Christians, Jews, Zoroastrians, and Hindus are just some examples of who are part and parcel to the Islamic material culture history as creators, influencers, and users. Amongst Muslims alone, you have many sects, including Sunnis and Shias, which have their own religious branches. You have varying what are referred to as schools of theological thought and a great variety in which Muslims practice or associate with Islam and engage with material cultural heritage. You can see in the images here, Muslims from around the world engaging in various forms of devotion in different ways. So what do we call these collections that encompass such diversity even religiously? There are debates over various terminology, which you can see here, including Islamic, Islamic hate, Islamic world, Muslim world, and Islamic cultures. If we look at some examples of institutions, you can see the British Museum, MFA Houston, and National Museum of Asian Art is Gallery of Arts of the Islamic World. Just Islamic is still used, such as the Doha Islamic Art Museum, the Louvre Islamic Art Gallery, and the University of Michigan 
Islamic manuscript collection are examples. The MFA Boston uses arts of the Islamic cultures and the Met when they reopened their galleries in 2011 decided to deal with this discourse by just using geographic regions as their new distinctly long gallery title, Art of the Arab Lands, Turkey, Iran, Central Asia, and later South Asia. These differences in terms and ways to describe collections are part of ongoing discussions about whether we need to distinguish between Muslim and non-Muslim, the secular and the profane, does such a separation even exist, or does Islamic culture embody all it has to offer? It's an interesting debate, which unfortunately in our short talk, we don't have time to go into, but it's why I chose Islamic collections for the title of the talk. Less because I think it's a perfect word for these collection materials, but more so to engage people's curiosity, to briefly introduce the debate over terminology with these collections, to emphasize that the Islamic world, its peoples and heritage are extremely diverse and complex, and to challenge pervading orientalist, racist, and Islamophobic stereotypes that Muslims are a homogenous group, the religion of Islam is unifaceted, and therefore so is Islamic culture and the Islamic world. Now that we've briefly gone over what we what might encompass Islamic collections and its complexities, what can we cover about considerations in caring for Islamic collections in the short remaining amount of time? We'll be mainly focusing on Muslim religious and cultural considerations for sacred and devotional items. And again, Muslims are very diverse, and much of what I will be discussing relates to the majority of Muslims. But I focus my research specifically on the largest sects of Islam, Sunniism, and Shiism. The Sunniism that follows the four major schools of thought of Islamic jurisprudence and Ithna Asharia or Twelver Shiism. The sacred and the profane, perhaps not the perfect terminology, but we will use them for convenience in this talk. For a certain Muslim perspective, from a certain Muslim perspective, it can be argued everything can be considered sacred to some degree, including the whole earth. For others, there is a distinction between the sacred and the secular. And because Muslim thought and practice vary, what is ordinary for one group of Muslims can be sacred for another group. However, there are some common sacredness for, some, for most Muslims. With the Quran being the most sacred material object in everyday lives and within collections, it is considered by Muslims to be the word of God, the same God of the Abrahamic tradition of Jews and Christians to the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who is considered by Muslims to be the last Abrahamic prophet. The Quran is considered a book of worship and it is the only sacred item that has specific rules in terms of handling. Muslims believe it should be treated with the utmost respect, and there is a verse in the Quran that states, most surely it's an honored Quran in a book that is protected, none shall touch it save the purified ones. So what does pure mean in this context? There are some differences of opinions, but the major contemporary opinion is you can't touch the Quran before performing a ritual ablution. Physical and spiritual cleanliness or purity are very much connected and intertwined in Islam. Ritual ablutions are performed before acts of worship like praying or for touching the Quran, the written words of God. Every mosque has an area for worshipers to perform their ablutions, the minor ablution called the du, before their prayer. You can see some images here. The Quran we are referring to that most Muslims agree shouldn't be touched without ritual purification is the physically written codex in the original revealed language of Arabic. This codex is also referred to as the Mus'haf in Arabic. Many, but not all Muslims also believe that the Qur that Quran or Quranic verses even outside the Mus'haf or compiled Quranic codex should also not be touched without ritual purification meaning skin contact on the actual written out text. That can include books of primarily commentaries or translations of the Quran, or Quranic verses which are found on objects throughout Islam's history, from pen boxes to tiles to lamps to tombstones, and which are found in books religious in nature and non-religious in nature. 
Particularly one Quranic verse that is common to see at the beginning of many books and on objects is the opening verse of the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, which means in the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. It is sometimes referred to as the Basmallah, and it's an important verse that is used on the uh, daily basis with Muslims saying it before daily tasks like eating a meal or to important events like giving a presentation. Because of this importance, it's a verse you may likely come across in your collections on objects like a Taraz textile fragment, to tiles, to manuscript collections that are both devotional and non-devotional in use, such as a book of astronomy. Other words often written or inscribed that hold reverence for Muslims are the name of God, which is Allah in Arabic, and the Prophet Muhammad and his family members. The name of God is the Basmala verse is in the Basmala verse itself, as you can see here, but it's used in other ways in different phrases or singularly on objects and art. You can see the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul has beautiful calligraphic medallions for Allah and Muhammad, his messenger at the front of the mosque. You will also find some of the Prophet Muhammad's family members written or inscribed to honor and remember them on objects. His daughter Fatima, his son in Ali, or his grandchildren Hassan, Hussein, and Zainab salam. You can see some of their names also in Hagia Sophia. Or on this chainmail shirt that have many of the names we are talking about. Allah, Muhammad, Fatima, Ali, Hassan, and Hussein all stamped onto the links providing a sort of talismanic protection for the wearer. There are no hard majority agreed rules about ablution for touching these names, although some believe a ritual ablution is needed, but all Muslims would agree these written or inscribed words should be treated with respect. Also, there are um, items for devotion, such as prayer beads, uh, prayer rugs, which Muslims often use to pray on, or turbas, which are soil or clay tablets used by Shia Muslims for prayers. Some Muslims also believe in protective or mystical materials, such as healing bowls or amulets, which may include miniature copies of the Quran. There are also relics and items of remembrance, particularly representational items of remembrance of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family. Items of remembrance can include processional standards called alams seen on the left, or banners and posters with images of the Prophet's grandsons and fellow martyrs. In many Shia cultures, they are used and displayed to commemorate at the martyrdom in the month of their deaths through street processions and community events and gatherings. All of these other religious materials that we've been discussing, including books that are religious in nature, material culture that is traditionally used for devotion like prayer beads, protective materials like amulets, and items of remembrance such as images of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, have all one specific rule that Muslims agree should um, upon in terms of care, and that they should be treated with respect. As a side note, it's often a misunderstanding that figurative imagery does not exist in Islamic religious tradition and culture. Animal representations are found in 2D and 3D form, in drawings or as objects, and images of people generally are found in 2D form on drawings and paintings and on 3D objects like plates, but less so in full 3D form. It should be noted that not all Muslims agree on figurative imagery, with some believing it's forbidden completely, for others it's forbidden to represent the prophets, their families, and the angels, while others, particularly in the contemporary Shia tradition, are more lenient or even part of religious culture and practice, as we saw in the last slide. As Muslim opinion varies and is varied over time and place, you will see a variety in these depictions, with full faces showing, faces covered, or no faces depicted, which may have been done contemporarily to the piece or altered later, including removing faces at another time when it was found offensible. When considering items that may not be devotional or religious in nature, books and the written word are held in very high regard for Muslims, both Sunnis and Shias. 
Calligraphy was considered the highest of the art forms in the Islamic world because the Quran plays a central role in Islam and because Islam teaches that knowledge is sacred. In Islam, there's a great emphasis on the importance of learning with prophetic statements about it, including one that states that every Muslim has a duty to seek knowledge. As a result, a deep respect for the written word on any object, but especially books developed in much of the Islamic world with a culture of treating them with extra care. This idea is not regulated to just religious-based texts, but to all knowledge and books, from science to philosophy. For example, in some parts of the Islamic world, such as parts of South Asia, it's considered disrespectful to put any book on the floor, even a textbook from school. How you handle it, how you gently place it on a table or surface are all embodied in a culture of respect for books and, and for knowledge. So now that is a lot of information, so let's try to simplify it and summarize it. Here are the general religious considerations for Islamic material culture that most Sunnis and Shias recognize. First, the Quran Mustaf, basically the Arabic written codex that is considered the word of God and not commentary or other text has the greatest role, that one should be in a state of ritual purification when touching it. Quranic verses, including the Basmallah, written or inscribed, or books of Quran with translation or commentary have more lenient options on purification with it being preferred by many Muslims and mandatory by some. The name of God, Allah, the prophets and the prophet Muhammad's family members are more lenient with only some opinions suggesting purification is needed. But beyond ritual purification, for everything listed on these slides, Muslims would agree they should all be treated with respect. The Quran deserves the highest amount of respect, followed by Quranic verses, the name of God, and the name of the prophets and Prophet Muhammad's family. So respect is a pretty generic term. So what does that mean and how can it practically be applied to collection care? There are not exact religiously defined parameters for treating an item with respect, and so it falls more into cultural norms of respect and intentionality. Larger themed ideas of respect and intentionality are what we already practice in our work as collection care professionals, that we regard each item as valuable, whether it, whatever that value may be, we rec recognize it as part of someone's culture and part of history, and we intentionally care for an item with that in mind. We aim to protect each item through appropriate handling, storage, and conservation treatment, and aim to recognize its importance through exhibited display. So what I hope to do in the remainder of the presentation is to touch upon more nuanced ideas of respect in relation to the, these collection care themes of handling, storage, treatment, and exhibition. How we approach materials and the bias we bring into our work goes hand in hand with how we care for and treat material culture with respect, including how we handle, store, treat, and display collections. In the collection care field, we are seeing more and more discussions about how our work is not neutral. When working with Islamic collections and any people's cultural heritage, especially when they are not our own culture, it's first and foremost important to reevaluate the lens in which we view these materials and the people behind them and to try to be conscious of the bias we all bring to our work. This is particularly important when working with Islamic materials in North America or Europe, where there are histories of colonialism, imperialism, racism, orientalism, and Islamophobia, both within our institutions and within our cultures at large. I am an American Pakistani Muslim with a multicultural family of Palestinians, Pakistanis, Indians, and Americans. And maybe that gives me an advantage to have a broader way of looking at the world, but it's still a conscious effort. And I'm still an American. And with that comes an American bias and a Western lens. As a conservator working in the US, I'm confronted with that lens all the time and I need to try to be mindful of it. Working with Islamic materials during my career as a conservator, I've come across the bias present in our field towards these collections which in turn affects the way we care for them. It's important to bring attention to examples of this bias before we can discuss ways to approach Islamic material culture, material culture sensitively and respectfully. As an example where I had to readjust my own Western lens was a way I viewed the use of silver for water in Islamic manuscript illuminations. 
Silver leaf was often used for depicting water in these illuminations, which over time tarnishes. When learning about pigment choices for Islamic illuminations, there seemed to be a sense of bafflement in the choice of silver, which would tarnish, tarnish calling creative choice and material question, knowledge into question. It was only when Cheryl Porter, a conservator who teaches about medieval pigment palettes, including Islamic color traditions, challenged us students in the bias we bring, that we had to challenge the way we view the color of water itself that our bias in assuming the whole world views water as blue and illustrates it as blue because water is blue. But just look at these images of the surface of lakes to oceans. It's why orcas and penguins are black on the tops of their bodies to blend in with the water when viewed from above called counter shading, which I recently just learned at an aquarium visit. This example made me realize how much bias I bring to my work. I could only view a color and a depiction one way a way that perpetuates orientalist views of oddity, inferior knowledge, and aesthetic choices. It was only when someone shifted my lens, I could understand and appreciate these materials and their makers on a much deeper level. It allows me to view the tarnished silver less as a degradation issue that I would like to find a way to treat and fix, and rather a conscious aesthetic of the makers. The broadening of my view also contributes to how I interact and treat Islamic bindings. When I first got into the field and was learning about Islamic bindings, I would read and hear that Islamic bindings are inherently weak and poor structures that don't hold up very well. It was clear to me that Islamic books were being compared with European and North American books, and that not only was the latter the gold standard, but how we view books in general could only be one finite way. I had to reevaluate how I was being taught to view these materials and the bias of a Western lens and sometimes the racism that comes with it. There is no lesser craftsmanship or lack of knowledge. It's just a different culture's approach to the creation, use, and existence of a material, in this case, a book. The goal for Islamic books, unlike a European book with wooden laced on boards and thick alum tod skin, may not be for book covers to last forever. Perhaps the viewpoint is that the importance of the book is the knowledge inside the book, that its preservation is the main goal and not the entire binding, and the covers do just that, protect the text and glorify its knowledge through crafted covers. So who cares if the covers break, you can just put on new ones or recycle other covers. And why not if you're gonna make a beautifully crafted cover, use silk thread and delicately paired leather to show off the fineness mm -hmm. of your skills and the luxury of your materials. It's a very different way to look at an Islamic binding. So keeping that bias in mind, um, when we work on Islamic materials, it's really important. Making sure you approach that the materials you are using, making sure your approach that materials you are using are sympathetic to the original construction and how it's used and not trying to shape or improve it to a certain non-Islamic standard. For example, when treating Islamic books, it's important to keep in mind that books are often constructed for use in book cradles and therefore more have more of a 90 degree opening and not a 180 degree opening as many European and North American books aim to achieve. Book cradles or stands are still commonly used by Muslims when sitting on the floor to read the Quran and to, pre to prevent it from touching the floor, which would be disrespectful. This should be kept in mind when treating an Islamic kit binding by trying not to fix the book's opening to 180 degrees and should be kept in mind when handling or displaying Islamic kit books as well to make sure they're supported and within cradles. Being conscious of what materials we use when treating Islamic kit collections is also important. Similar to the Jewish faith, eating pork is forbidden for Muslims as well. For Muslims, pigs are considered unclean animals, and because of these rules and unclean associations with porcine products, it would be inappropriate to use porcine gelatin, hog hair brushes, or any other porcine-based tools on Islamic collection items, especially those religiously Islamic in nature. Gelatin is neither historically sympathetic and Porcine gelatin would definitely not be respectful. So alternatives such as Isenglass or Fenori may be better choices. 
Being conscious of the reason for using alcohol on an Islamic collection item, particularly a sacred item, and how much alcohol to use should also be considered. Alcohol consumption is also forbidden in Islam, and while many Muslims would agree that the context for use in conservation is very different than consumption, and the alcohol evaporates off the item, one should always be mindful of conservation choices and the reasons behind them, including the reason for using alcohol and how much to use. So as mentioned earlier, the Quran was Huff, and for some Quranic verses and the name of God and the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family are have rules associated with handling in terms of purification. So what do we do? As much of the collection care specialists in the audience may not be Muslim, ritual ablutions are not a practical or one can argue a spiritual option. So should Qurans not be preserved, not exhibited, or be removed from collections altogether? Most Muslims would not agree this is the answer. The Qurans in many collections are not meant for worship, but usually for their historic, aesthetic, or scholarship purposes, where there is more flexibility in Islamic jurisprudence opinions. And in Islam, intention plays a large role. In collections, the intention to preserve, study, and celebrate the Quran are acts of respect for Muslims' most sacred object. But there are steps that can be taken when handling sacred items, though, that can help be more respectful to religious rules of touch. One step that can be taken is to limit direct skin to object contact when needing to handle sacred texts, particularly the Quran, Mus'haf, and Quranic verses. One can wear nitro gloves whenever it's possible without risking the safety of the collection item due to decreased dexterity. Nitro gloves provide more dexterity and are less slippery than cotton gloves. Turning pages while wearing gloves can be difficult and can risk damaging the pages. So some alternatives would be to use a thin micro spatula to turn pages. And a micro spatula or another pointing tool can also be used when needing to point out verses in a Quran for a class or for showing patrons information that can reduce skin to sacred text contact. Sometimes a micro spatula will not be practical or safe if you need to turn a lot of pages, so one should practice rules of avoiding the media when turning the page, which is better preservation-wise and more religiously respectful. When treating the paper or media with, within a Quran, one could try to limit the skin to sacred text contact by having a piece of blotter paper under your working hands. This again is both a great small adjustment to a treatment practice preservation wise because it means less hand oils on the media and an alternative that incorporates religious and cultural respect into our practice. And in, in gloves or other tools can't be used when handling or treating a sacred text safely, at the very least, washing your hands right before touching the item would be the most respectful practice. And in terms of other ways to respectfully hand, handle sacred collection materials like the Quran, we should consider how it's being picked up and transported. For libraries, that includes book drops. This is something libraries can consider adjusting to their collection care and circulating procedures. Because Qurans and other religious texts, like a book of prophetic sayings, are meant to be treated with respect, most Muslims believe they should be handled with great care. So being dropped haphazardly into a pile of books would be considered inappropriate to a lot of Muslims. This came up recently at the San Francisco Public Library where the conservators there were working on a Quran in the circulating collection and were mindful of it being a sacred text and wanted to be sensitive about the choices they made. Two questions that came up were whether they could add labels to the Quran, such as spine labels, book plates, barcodes, and whether it was appropriate for a regular book drop return. Adding materials to Quran, such as labels that are not meant to harm, mock, or alter the Quran are not an issue religiously and are found historically. But because book drops would be considered inappropriate by many Muslims, they worked with their circulation staff to add a label to the book, instructing patrons to return it to the circulation desk, helping to reduce the use of the book drop. 
For storage practices, enclosures such as boxes or four-flap enclosures for take sacred texts like a Quran mushaf should be considered. Not only is it helpful in terms of preservation, but it would reduce the skin to sacred object contact with, without ritual purity that is in opposition to some Islamic rules. Enclosures such as cloth wrappers and satchels have been traditionally used in the Islamic world for the same respectful reasons of both protecting the Holy Quran and by being able to move it around and handle it and without needing to be in a state of ritual purity to do so and they're still used to this day. For many Muslim cultures, ideas of respect towards the Quran include placement of the Quran, which should be kept in mind for handling, storage, and transportation, and display practices. As we mentioned earlier, for many Muslims, putting the Quran on the floor is considered disrespectful, and it's why book stands were used. Because the floor is representative of the lowliest point in the room and a surface that we walk on that may be dirty. For many Muslims, they care for Qurans by keeping them away from the floor and never placing anything on top of the Quran. Additionally, they are mindful of the Quran's placement to their waist with a preference to carry and store, store Qurans above waist level if safe for the person and the Quran. These considerations can be kept in mind in collection care. When retrieving books, make sure to have the Quran on the top of the pile that it is placed on and try to have it on the top and not the bottom shelf of the cart. If storage place space is flexible, store Qurans above waist level as long as it's ergonomically safe for retrieval and safe for the Quran. The same idea could be considered when packing a crate for loans or totes within libraries with Islamic sacred texts being on the top um, when it's safe for the materials. Additionally, care handling labels can be added to the outside of enclosures to remind or bring awareness to take extra care when handling. Also consider placement with what might be housed or displayed right next to a Quran or other sacred items. For example, some Muslims might feel it's disrespectful to house something like shoes right in the same box as a miniature Quran. Or as an extreme example, putting Duchamp's fountain next to a contemporary Quranic calligraphic art piece in a contemporary gallery. When creating labels um, of it for exhibits, be mindful when including Quranic verses, the name of Allah and the prophet, um, the prophets and their um, the prophet Muhammad's family members about how you might dispose of these labels during rotations or the ends of a temporary exhibit. Throwing these sacred work, words or texts in the trash with other refuse is considered disrespectful by most Muslims, especially for Quranic text. For many Muslims, the most respectful and practical way to dispose of sacred text today is to shred and recycle, which can be practical and sensitive way for museums to dispose of labels as well. For vinyl wall labels that can't be recycled, cutting up sacred words and texts before having to throw them in the trash may be the best alternative. But being mindful of use of sacred text choices for labels should be kept in mind as well to make sure you can dispose of it respectfully. As you've heard me say and seen in the slides, I sometimes add honorifics to the ends of the name of Allah, the Prophet Muhammad, and his family members. While it's not mandatory, it's a practice of respect by Muslims, both Sunni and Shia. It can be considered to, it can be considered to add to labels as a sign of respect towards religious Muslim customs, as this exhibit at the Rhode Island School of Design decided to do. Choosing transliterated words that are more widely expect, accepted by native speakers or cultural users should be considered over translation transliterations that perpetuate mispronunciations. This may be more for the audience in North America and English majority speaking countries. Um, but for example, Quran and Muslim spelled this way were common English spellings, but neither transliterated spellings provide accurate pronunciations and are often seen not only as outdated,
but now culturally insensitive and sometimes incendiary with Muslims being used often in relation to Islamophobic rhetoric. The spellings preferred by Muslims and Arabic speakers are spelled this way and are more commonly used in academia today. With spellings on labels, the same considerations in terms of pronunciation should be made if creating audio guides, classes, or docent tour tours of Islamic exhibits. For example, pronouncing certain countries closer to how those nationalities would pronounce them, like Iraq or Iraq instead of Iraq, or Iran or Iran instead of Iran, and Pakistan instead of Pakistan instead of Pakistan are some examples. Additionally, words such as Muslim and Islam, because Muslim span, Muslims span the globe and speak many different languages, their pronunciations of Arabic-based words like Muslim and Islam might slight, might, may slightly differ, but as mentioned in the last slide, in general, most Muslims do not pronounce it Muslim or Islam, with some finding it offensive and incendiary with increasing trends of using these pronunciations in Europe and North America in relation to Islamophobic rhetoric. So while these may only seem like words and pronunciations can be difficult, it can be a way of creating a more inclusive and welcome space. And keep in mind that imperialism, wars, racism, and Islamophobia play a role in individual sensitivities of people's language and ownership of terms of identification. As words are mispronounced in media and online, my recommendation would be to reach out to the communities of the collection material you are making an audio guide, class, or docent training to ask for their preferred pronunciations of terms of identification and association. As we discussed earlier, figurative imagery is present throughout Islamic material culture to this day, but Muslims are very much divided, particularly on imagery of the Prophet Muhammad with some seeing it as a tool of respectful remembrance and others as a disrespectful false representation. This is something to keep in mind and be sensitive to both audiences who are connected to these materials. Museums have dealt with these differences of opinions in different ways, with some posting large labels at the entrance of galleries explaining why they chose to show historical images of the prophet, to some museums that choose to not provide any context for the choice of the exhibited imagery, nor their historical and religious significance. While I don't have practical tips for a very complicated issue, collection institutions should be sensitive to both sides of the spectrum of opinions. Many museums showing figurative imagery of the prophet argue that this is part of Islamic visual culture and cannot be censored out of the historical narrative. While this is a valid argument, what I rarely hear in these collection debates are certain recognitions of biases we bring to our work and opinions. Recognition that many of the people making these decisions historically at institutions in the West have not identified as religiously or culturally associated with the Islamic world. Recognition that Islamophobia and racism within our culture, culture unfortunately may shape biases. And recognition that many collections at these institutions have been acquired with murky histories, including theft from people and lands they originate from, all of which add multiple layers when determining how you make decisions to other people's religious and cultural materials. In my opinion, I would like to be hearing more from a diverse range of voices from the Muslim communities and their desires for their heritage. Additionally, I'd like to be hearing more from museums and art historical scholarship about a recognition and a refocus on reevaluating some of these biases and how we can engage more with Muslim communities, how we can be more creative in our approaches that may allow for more Muslim inclusivity and not just the Muslims who we approve of because they fit well with our Western Islamic art historical scholarship when their religiosity doesn't get in the way. We should keep these historical origins of many Islamic collections in mind, especially at institutions in Europe and North America, where colonialism, theft, and other dubious practices may have played a role. It is important to recognize this history and make it transparent and be considerate of any deep emotions or trauma that can be associated with collection materials when caring for these collections and how they are displayed. 
For collection care specialists involved in acquisitions, such as conservators dealing with acquisition assessments, there should be an awareness that theft, murky provenances, and unethical practices within the selling and buying of Islamic material culture is not a thing of the past and very much present today, especially with instability and wars in the past decades. Part of caring for our collections is to make sure they are acquired ethically and responsibly. If involved in acquisitions, materials that lack a provenance, especially from present day to at least the 1970s should not be purchased and ethical practical gu practice guidelines should be established for every institution. During acquisition assessments, signs of distress associated with unethical practices should be noted. For example, for a manuscript, recent destruction of ownership marks or signs that pages that have been torn out of a book and other pages from the same book are circulating on the market. And lastly, when discussing Islamic collections, as mentioned, it's important to be aware of the Islamophobia and racism, including anti-Arab and anti-Palestinian culture that is present within our field at museums and other collection institutions. While not new, over the past year, there has been a significant increase in Palestinian and pro-Palestinian artists being censored. Entire shows canceled, artwork removed from exhibition, or even entire Islamic art shows postponed. These actions at our cultural heritage institutions that are meant to protect and honor people's material culture are complicit in stigmatizing peoples and culture and continuing to uphold a racist and Islamophobic uh, culture and narrative. It is something we as cultural heritage protectors need to proactively oppose and to not uphold, and we need to be active par participants in the dismantling of racism, colonialism, and Islamophobia within our professions and our institutions. In a common Muslim tradition that often begins or ends a talk or presentation, or as Malcolm X ended his autobiography with the lines, all of the credit is due to Allah, only the mistakes have been mine. I end the talk similarly, noting that all good that has come from this talk is due to Allah, including all these people and organizations he has put in my path that have advised, educated, and guided me. I am truly grateful for their valuable time and knowledge sharing, and I have tried to faithfully consider, critically analyze, and pass along what I've learned and experienced. All the mistakes that have been made are mine and mine alone. Um, so thank you to Robin for moderating and organizing the session. And thank you all for your time. I look forward to your questions and I hope I can answer them to the best of my abilities. And for all those that I don't get to, you can reach me via email and I'll try to respond to you in a timely manner. Thank you, Aisha. That was wonderful. Um, I will add to that we've, I put it in the chat, but we put a copy of your presentation on our website. And I, I did the very registrar thing of, of your presentation was so lovely, but we were talking about all the images in it and you were like, should I credit them? And I was like, the, the registrar in me was like, probably. <laughs> I was like, so thank you for putting the time and effort into finding all the credits and everything in there. Um, and we're hearing <laughs> lots of very nice compliments in the chat right now. So thank you everyone for for listening along. Um, I'm going to give it a minute or so for questions to come in. We already have some. Um, while we do that, we give a minute for people to type. Um, I really wanted to point out about how you were talking about the bias issue, because that is something I've thought about a lot. Um, I've started out my career in archaeology, where it was very much like you dig things up, and that's just what they are, and you move on. And as my career has taken them on, I've realized that you bring so many inherent biases just from your background, your life, your education. And I'm, I'm really glad you, you pointed that out because I think everyone has them, right? It's just- Yeah, and we're like definitely them. not immune. So, I mean, myself included, I, I had my own biases towards Islamic materials that I had to really reevaluate and I'm still always reevaluating. Yeah. I think that's the healthy way to be, right? Is, is just, you're constantly like, okay, let's really think about it. You know what I mean? And think about what we're bringing to it. So thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. Um, so first question I'm going to hit is, are there any sacred texts or situations that would be of concern in terms of the gender of the conservator? I know there are issues around this for sacred objects and in indigenous collections. Yeah, for, um, so religiously, as I, I mentioned, you know, Muslims are not mon a monolith. 
um, and neither is their religious opinion. It really comes down to ritual purification. And so there are rules about what breaks a ritual purification. And that generally is, I didn't go into it because it was a little, I thought it might be too detailed, but generally it is sort of thing, you know, sort of bodily fluids that leave the body. So urination, you know, um, using the restroom basically, but that includes menstruation. So any sort of fluids leaving the body. And so that kind of breaks ritual purification for some Muslims, uh, for, well, for in general, for all Muslims, but um, whether you a woman during her period or menstruation can touch a mushaf Quran, that is um, sort of debated. Some will say no, because she can't be in a state of ritual purification because there is bodily fluids that are sort of exiting the body. Um, and some, there are some uh, opinions that state that if it's being used for, um, for like teaching or for study, or, you know, for example, working on maybe, you know, as a conservator, then there are sort of linear, lenient, more lenient um, Islamic rules about it. Um, but it does differ, you know, opinion wise. So some Muslim women will choose not to um, uh, handle a Quran mushaf while they're um, menstruating and some are okay. Less so for, you know, devotional acts, but more so for like if they're studying or teaching or working on it or need to move it around or whatever. So it does differ. So it's less about a gender issue and more about sort of ritual purification issue. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is this is a good question because I'm sure this is where a lot of small and mid-sized are at. It says, we want to reach out to the small Islamic group in our community because we have no representation for their community in our state museum. How would you suggest reaching out in a respectful way? None of the staff is from the community. Yeah, and um, so this was something I tried to think about, you know, whether to include it or not. And it is, um, so you, I mean, I think reaching out is, I don't know that it would be disrespectful at all. You can send them an email or a phone call or, you know, and just explain, you know, we're at a museum, we'd like more Muslim representation. We'd like to include more of the Muslim community. You know, how can we engage with, with them and, and have a discussion with them? I, I can't imagine very many um, uh, Muslim community mosques or masjids responding um, uh, negatively towards it. I will say, um, don't expect that there are going to be Islamic scholars at every Muslim community. So there's sort of a difference. There are prayers that are led at communities where um, a leader might be able to lead somebody in prayer, but they may not have any sort of religious um, Islamic scholarship background, where they might not know all the like Islamic religious rules around things. So don't expect, and then of course, as practitioners, not everybody knows all of the, you know, very nuanced Islamic legal rules and opinions. So just keep that in mind if you are gonna reach out to communities that you can't expect them to have um, a lot of, you know, scholarship there. There might be, there's lots of communities that are headed by, um, uh, people with PhDs and um, Islamic, you know, um, religious degrees. So there are, but just keep that in mind that you might just have sort of practitioners going for prayer and may not have that knowledge. Um, so my suggestion is if you, if you have a few communities in your area, try to reach out to a few because they will have differences of opinions, including potentially on how they want if you have collection items that are associated with these communities, how they might want them to be exhibited and including their own religious opinions. So with some being far more strict about what they would like to see done and some a lot more lenient. So just keep that in mind, you know, if you get, you know, an opinion that is sort of um, much more strict, that is, makes it very hard to, um, exhibit or display certain items you have to be respectful of their opinion but you can but there are also may be other opinions out there and if you're going with the more lenient opinions 
keep in mind that other people might have different opinions that are more strict. So just that's sort of my, um, I know it's a little murky, but I, I would say reach out, just keep all of that in mind that um, scholarship may not be present at a, a Muslim community um, and that there are very difference of opinions. And I, I recommend reaching out to a few. Yeah, multiple sources is usually better in most mm -hmm. things, in my opinion. Um, I think we can hit one final question. So it says, if my institution has a text that is completely in Arabic, but I don't know how sacred the text is, how should I go about handling it? Should I treat it with the utmost respect like it was from the Quran or texts or like, or text like that? Yeah, so I put up a few things and I know you won't be able to, I, you know, I put up some images like the word of God and some other things, but it is very hard, I will say, to identify it if you're not an Arabic speaker and calligraphic and paleographic, like different hands are just make it very complicated. But so, of course, you could reach out to somebody in the community or at the ins at an institution at your institution, if you do have maybe, you know, somebody who has Arabic knowledge somewhere, you can always reach out. Um, you could email me too, if you'd like, and I could try to help you. My knowledge uh, in terms of my language knowledge is limited, but I, I do have resources to go to. But um, generally I would probably, if it was me and I didn't know, and it's not in the catalog record, which is the first thing I would go to, to double check is to see if there's any kind of record within my institution that sort of suggests what it might be. Um, then, and maybe Google it, you know, after I see a name on a catalog record and see what it is, that would be sort of my first like line of investigation. If I still had no information that came up and I didn't have any resources like people wise to go to, I'm just would probably be on the more conservative side. And I think some of the practical tips that I offered, such as like washing hands and like not touching the text are sort of great preservation practice anyways. And, um, you know, keeping it on maybe the top pile of a book, books that are stacked, why not? Um, as long as the other books don't need to be on top for any other reason. So I just would tend to be on the more conservative, like, more careful side whenever I have material that I'm not entirely sure if it's sacred or not, whether it's Islamic materials, Judaica, any kind of material where I have to, I'm, it may be in question that it might be a sacred item. I generally tend to be on the more careful side with how I handle and work with it. Yeah. I think erring on the side of caution is always a smart way to go just because you don't know. And the last thing, and this is true for all these things when we're talking about just cultural considerations, no one in our community wants to make anyone upset. Like, I, you know what I mean? Like, I always think about that yeah. in the long run. Like no one, at least as far as I've worked in my almost 20 years working in this field, like no one's like, I really want to make those folks mad at me. Like no one wants that. Yeah. So, it's not our job. <laughs> no. <laughs> so it's not our it's, goal at all. Our goal is to respect Correct. people's cultural heritage and that's what we're trying to aim to do exactly so i'm gonna have to wrap up today's program i know there's still some questions floating around out there but i'll see about pulling the reports and getting them over to aisha so she could take a look at them um but i do want to point out this one comment that came out in the chat which i really like just to said thank you this was so wonderful as mindful and informed as i try to be this is such an important reminder that we do not know what we do not know and ignorance is not a valid excuse to not be doing right by these collections and communities. And I really liked that comment. So thank you to the person who put that in there. I think that wraps it up very nicely. So um, thank you again to our presenter today, Aisha Wahab. We really appreciate it. Um, I will be posting this recording most likely by early next week, probably Monday, if I can really get my act together. Um, the recording will be up. The resources are there. I want to say thank you again to our presenter. Thank you to IMLS and FAIC for supporting C2C Care as always. And we will see you all in October for our next free webinar. So thanks and everyone stay safe through this very rainy weekend for most of us. Yes, please stay safe. Thank you. All right. Thanks again.